I'll start by apologizing because I'm actually not a non-gaming related talk despite being in this track. Um, also, I wasn't sure which order these two slides were supposed to go in. So, like, that's me. That's what I'm talking about. Um, cool. So, who am I? Uh, I am Jeremy Burgess. I'm technical director at Pickpock. I've been in the industry for about 13 years. That's the games industry. Um, I started out my journey of game development at She Interactive uh, back in 2006. Decided I wanted to see the world, moved to the UK, worked at Codemasters for a while, uh, came back and joined She after it had changed its name to Pickpock. And in that time, I've had to drop into lots of projects, seen lots of code bases that I was not responsible for, and in those scenarios, often you have to be useful as fast as you can. So that's what I'm going to talk about today. But to ground that a little bit, behind me, I hope, you will see some code appear. This code is fictitious. It isn't real. I didn't write it. Well, I did write it, but... <laughs> But it's never, it's not, not real code. Um, and when you see code like this, you might think something like this. <laughs> and, and, and what I want to do today is, is, is help you through this pain. I want to give you some tools, approaches, and ways of thinking about code to help you deal with this scenario where you have to deal with an unfamiliar code base where stuff doesn't seem to make sense and decisions seem uh, irrational, perhaps, not what you had expected. Mm -hmm. And I want to give you a focus on where the code comes from to understand where it is now. So to think about code as a, as a process and a product of people. So without further ado, it's story time. So it was a dark and stormy night. And at their desk was a programmer. And that programmer was happily working away on their ordinary work, tippity tapping, ignoring, ignoring that thunder outside. Suddenly thunder rolled and they were told that another project that they had never seen before needed to be finished. And what's more, that project's entire team was gone. <laughs> it was up to that programmer and a few others to finish the job. To ground this a little bit more, the real situation as it happened was that my team and I inherited a game. It was nearly done. Um, so the gameplay was there, the UI was in place. Levels were all good. There was no real like gameplay-related work to be finished. But we had very limited access to the original team. We had one of their programmers for a few weeks. And um, foolishly, we thought, maybe they can just finish everything. Um, they didn't. <laughs> and, and it also crashed on its target devices. So this was an iOS game uh, or mobile game. Uh, it crashed out of memory on half gigabyte iDevices, which were still dominant in the market at the time. So we're talking about iPhone 4s, 4Ss, iPad 2s and iPad minis. Um, and had never been built to deal with 16 by 9 devices, and just to make our lives more difficult, Apple had just announced the iPhone 5, which was the first 16 by 9 iDevice. So the job, as it was presented to me and mine, as I was a lead programmer at the time, it was exciting, um, was get it out the door. That was the first and most important thing. Um, there was no regard for update this thing, but we had to make this thing that was not quite a product into a product which could make money in the market and, and, and do what it was supposed to do. It had to run on half gigabyte iDevices reasonably reliably because, again, most iDevices at the time were half gigabyte iDevices. And make it look okay on an iPhone 5. And prepare for Android. Android wasn't in the immediate roadmap, and in fact we were going to hand over some of the Android work to someone else. But Given that we had to get it going on iPhone 5, it made sense to try and deal with arbitrary resolutions and semi-arbitrary uh, aspect ratios. So what to do? Well, the first thing you should always do in this scenario, and I'll come back to this again and again and again, is talk to the team if you have them. Now, as I said, we kind of misfired on this one because we thought in our arrogance that they could get it done. And so instead of bothering them with discussion, we just let them work. That helped, but it didn't quite get us there. Second thing to do is establish your priorities, and I'll talk about what those are in just a moment. Uh, and then third, for us, the highest priority thing that we did do while we still had access to this program was understand the build process, because if you can't build the game, you can't ship the game. Now, it's true, we could have ported it to our existing build process. They used Cruise Control, we used Team City. Um, we were all Unity people, and it was delightful. Um, but it just felt like a piece of work we didn't need to do. We could just live with what they had done there, and it would be fine. And then get started on something you know pretty well, if you possibly can. So what I did, oh, my time is not going. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, 
So what I did first, the thing that I took on um, as our first task was memory optimization. And the reason I did this was because I'd done a lot of it in the past. Uh, memory optimization is, uh, in all engines, a fairly well-contained and understandable task. Like, you have a certain budget you want to hit, you want to be below this amount of memory all the time, and more often than not, most of that work is in asset optimization, so understanding what assets you need loaded when and how big they need to be, um, at least for games. Uh, so I'd done this a lot on other projects, and it provided a point of entry to the code base that fit my experiences. So even though I didn't know this code base, I did know how to think about memory, I knew how to identify what was being used, and I knew how to, to work through that task. It also didn't hurt that everyone agreed that crashing on most of our target devices was by far the biggest problem we had. No one was going to say, yeah, don't deal with that first. Everyone agreed, get it running well first. So, most of the time, actually no, I'm missing a bit of my story. So at Codemasters, which is where this all happened, we had a, an iPad mini, and on the back was a sticker which said, dirty device, do not turn off. And that iPad mini was terrible. It crashed all the time in everything. Um, everything we ever made crashed on that device. And that was okay, so long as it didn't crash very much on that device. So our gold standard was get the game running most of the time on that device. And, <laughs> and at this time, when we inherited it, it really didn't. It, it crashed most of the time on that device. But on normal devices, most of the time we were okay. It was only when going into certain big levels that it would crash, or when playing multiple levels in a row. So we were not too far from where we needed to be. We weren't there, but we were close. So profiling was the first port of call. And it turned out that there were some enormous UI textures that, to make things even worse, were Atlas, even when only one of them was used at a time. So things like loading images, where you would have one loading image. Um, they were in a big atlas of four of these loading images, which meant that you had like a, an enormous texture atlas. Um, and it was just sitting there, and it was very, very big. So. I don't know how many of you know the Retina iPad resolution, but it's 2056 by, no, 2048 by 1536, um, which is big. And so if you want things to look native, if you want things to render at a one-to-one -one pixel size, the textures need to be huge. Um, and so everything had been authored for Retina iPads, so we could easily get away with shrinking them for half gigabyte iDevices, and that was what we did. So. Before I continue to talk about how we actually did this, there's something to know about this code base. It was all hard-coded, everything. Um, the developers had been uncomfortable with Unity and they'd worked around it whenever they could. Um, so when you open this project, what you would see is one scene, and that scene was called boot. And you would open the boot scene, and in the boot scene was one object, and that object was called boot. And <laughs> on that object, you would find one script, and you can probably guess what it was called. <laughs> yeah. So that proved to be problematic for all sorts of other things that we needed to do, but for this, that was awesome, because everything was loaded in scripts. And so all we needed to do was mediate the load, make a few changes to code so that we could work with raw textures rather than sprite sheets and atlases, and away we went. There was a bit of work around making the layout work, especially where we took things out of atlases and where things expected things to be particular sizes and they now weren't always the same sizes. But by and large, this got us to where we needed to be. So, we were done, and that was great. But no job is good without learnings. And because I then had to go and do the second part of this, which was getting this to work on 16 by nine devices, it was important to reflect on what we had learned, or at least when writing this talk, it was important to reflect on what I had learned. So the authors of this code base had a background in traditional native engines, and I suspect, but don't know, that they had been told they had to use Unity for this project. Um, Ego, the Codemaster's internal engine, did not work on mobile at this time. That was still in the works. And so everything that we did on mobile, and the studio that I was part of within Codemasters was focused on mobile, was built in Unity. Um, and that was fine. I was a big, big fan by that stage. Um, and so they'd worked around Unity wherever they possibly could. They didn't want to work with it, so they worked around it. This is important for understanding the other decisions that they made because it has consequences all throughout the code base and all throughout the way they thought about the problems they were trying to solve. Also, they didn't have UI art resource. And so when building their UI, 
They had done it in a way that worked for them and not for artists. Nothing was in scenes or prefabs. Everything was laid out in code. Um, and that, again, very important if you're trying to fix layout-related issues. And finally, they had a get-it-done remit. Um, they had built this game with the goal of building this particular game. Again, they'd been told, I suspect, to use Unity, um, and they had, they had not invested in tools. They just worked on getting the game built and functional. And the game was fun. Like, full credit to them, they had built a fun, functional game, which actually did pretty well when it came out. But... All of these things had huge implications for how the code looked and how you needed to work with it. So job two was getting the UI to work on 16 by 9 phones. So the UI was just as hard-coded as everything else. Everything in this game, hard-coded. It was awesome. <laughs> sort of. Um, nothing was laid out in prefabs and scenes, and just to make things a little bit more difficult, there were two systems. So there was one for the HUD and the settings menu that was in-game, and one for the main menus, and they were totally distinct. They didn't talk to each other at all. When you loaded into game, you went into this one UI space, and when you came back to the main menus, you were out of it again. Uh, now my instinct, I will be honest, was, oh my goodness, what have they done? Can I rebuild it? And the answer was no, I couldn't. Didn't have time, didn't have the budget, and our UI artists who worked in the studio that I worked for were all allocated to other tasks. So we had to make it work their way, and that meant understanding what they had done. So, again, take it in parts. First the HUD, then the main menus. So the HUD worked basically as you'd expect. I don't know how many of you have done UI work, but on mobile, um, where you have to deal with lots of different uh, screen pixel sizes and aspect ratios, it's very common to have a fixed logical resolution in the narrower of the two dimensions. So if your portrait, you fix the width. If your landscape, you fix the height. And then you say, for instance, the screen will always be logically 640 pixels high, and the sides will stretch in and out. And so you get this nice behavior where it's easy to lay things out and have things take up the same proportional size within the more limited di direction of the user, user interface. And the HUD kind of worked that way. It didn't have any respect for super high resolution devices. It just worked with a fixed aspect ratio, a fixed logical, res um, fixed logical resolution. But it didn't have any support for anchoring. So the way they had dealt with the fact that iPhones were three by two and iPads were four by three was by having two layouts. And that was it, and that, that kind of worked for them. But thankfully, this was a fairly easy thing to fix. All I needed to do was go through all the elements, make sure they were grouped logically, and anchor the different bits of the screen to the middle, left, right, bottom, or top of the screen, and done. Fairly easy. It worked well enough. There were bits that made that more tricky, but that was basically the task for the HUD. Easy enough. The main menus, on the other hand, were a lot more complicated. So they were built using methods and classes to assist in layout. So again, the code you're about to see is fake. It's not real but it gives you some sort of idea of how this looked. You would have a script for every single screen, and the scripts would look something like this, because all the screens had to look roughly the same as menu screens do, but they all had their own script that built them. They didn't have any shared componentry at all. They just had code was the shared way of thinking about it. And then to make things a little bit more tricky, they used one-to-one -one resolutions. So everything was actually rendered like in UI coordinates in the pixel space of the screen. So as the screen changed resolutions, you had more or less pixel space in all directions. So ultimately to work with this thing, I had to understand it and then work with it to get things done, which mostly required targeted changes to helper methods to allow them to be a little bit more flexible and to allow them to accommodate changing aspect ratios beyond the two that they had already dealt with. And then go through every single screen and fix stuff that's broken. And that sounds super laborious, and it was, but under the circumstances, it was by far the lowest impact way to solve the problems we had. And again, you have to remember that our remit was also get it done. We wanted to get this thing out the door, and we had no real intention of ever coming back to it unless it was astronomically successful. And if it was, then that was a different problem. Like, it wasn't the problem that we had in front of us then. So thankfully that wasn't too bad, and we only really needed to think about 16 by 9. We weren't in the delightful space we are now, where we have to deal with 19 and a half by 8, and notches, and 
all of that kind of fun jazz, and that got us there. So that was done. So what can we learn from this as a task? Because this story is a true story, this really happened. We got the work done, we did it reasonably cheaply, it didn't end up affecting our other timetables massively, we constrained the work to me and one or two other people. The first thing, when you're dropping into an unfamiliar code base, when you're dropping into an unfamiliar project and you're given a task, is you need to respect your remit. It's easy to just burn time doing work that doesn't need to be done. And sometimes that's the right thing to do. Sometimes there really is a valid reason to invest in refactoring and doing architectural reworks and rethinking things, but sometimes there just isn't. And again, although it rubbed up against me the wrong way, the solution to the problems that we had in front of us was to get the job done in as cheap a way as possible in a way that only affected code. Understand the code with an emphasis on the why. Thinking about where these programmers had come from, why they did the things they did, and, and how they came to make those decisions that I didn't necessarily agree with, really helped me in terms of not feeling uh, unnecessary rage and, and working through some challenging problems. And then, if possible, use what you know as a tool to start on something you un already understand. So this is kind of like cooking in someone else's kitchen. I don't know how many of you have ever had to do this, but one thing you realize really quickly is that the ergonomics of a kitchen are very unique. Um, like, where are the pots? Where are the pans? Where are the knives? Where are the chopping boards? Um, how, where do I put dirty things? Where are the spaces to do this sort of thing? If you cook something you don't know in someone else's kitchen, you're going to find it way harder than if you cook something you do. Because if you know what you're doing in that alternative kitchen, it, it just flows. You know what you're supposed to do, you just need to figure out where the bits you don't know are. Cool. So moving away from this story, let's talk a little bit in generalities. There are lots of types of drop-in. There are lots of scenarios where you might drop into an existing team or an existing project. You might be there to fix bugs. Very, very common at the end of a project, tail end of a project or an update, where there's just too much stuff that's busted and you need more people to come in and fix things. Um, probably the most common, I think. Finishing the project is a very good common case, good, a very common case as well, where something is not quite done and it needs to be finished, either by a new team or by new members of an existing team. Maybe you have expert knowledge, which is lacking within the team in question. Um, this is something that's happened not very often to me personally, but I have directed people to do this where I've had graphics programmers and I've said, I need you on this team because there are visual rendering issues and or performance issues and we really need someone to solve those problems. Or maybe just an extra team member is needed and you're being added midway through a project and the project's been going for a year or something like that. Um, that's not as time critical, but you still face exactly the same problems of getting to grips with an unfamiliar code base. Um, and people will expect you to be productive within a reasonable amount of time. Well, you want to be productive. You want to be a helpful member of the team. So let's talk about code, because what I'm really talking about here is code structure. Code is an expression of a person or group's intent. Code is not a pure ivory tower thing that exists separate to the task that is trying to be achieved or the people that are trying to achieve it. So you have these two things where you have your intent, you want to do something, and then you have the experience, knowledge, and situational like the scenario that you bring to it that will create a particular expression of that intent within a code base. Thinking about code in this way means that if you really want to understand code, you really want to grok fully why a piece of code looks the way it does, you need to figure out what the author was trying to do, how they were trying to do it, and the things that they thought were really important when they did it. This is, yeah, yeah. <laughs> now I would note, and caveat this, that this is complicated when you deal with a system that's been had many hands on it. I'm sure everyone's seen this at some point. You see a file, it makes no sense. Um, there are bits that don't seem to fit in there, the system's goals seem dissolute, and the commenting is very unclear, You're like why is this even here? That tends to be a function of multiple people or multiple goals trying to go into a single system or code base over its lifespan, which is something that happens all the time in game development because it's an iterative process, right? You don't, truth is the best laid plans never survive contact with the enemy. You, get there halfway through and you need to change what you're doing. 
Anyway, so crucial to understanding any piece of code is understanding the intent of the author and the ways in which they might then express that intent. And there are lots of influences on this. So different programmers have different preferences. Um, anyone who's worked with lots of coders over time will see this very tangibly. Um, if you've ever been a lead, you'll really see this tangibly, where you're actually looking at lots of people's code and looking at the way they approach tasks. Um, so certain people prefer lots of small methods to the point that they will actually break up methods that they find in other people's code because they think it's clearer, and maybe they're right, but again, it's a preference thing. Some people like to use classes and scope to manage code flow. Uh, the conventional name for this is resource acquisition is initialization, or RAII, but you see this pattern in using patterns in C Sharp. Um, in C++, you don't need that. You just create a, a struct at the beginning of a scope, and when you go outside that scope, it destroys itself, and then you can manage the lifetime of the object through it, and you'll see some people just use this all over the place. Some people like functional programming, and even though they're not working in a functional environment in uh, get most game engines, they will apply that love of functions and functional tree structures to the code that they're writing. Some people really, really like simplicity and will lean into it hard and will fight back against attempts to over-engineer um, in a very powerful way. And some people love design patterns, big D design patterns I'm talking about here, like the observer pattern, factory pattern, all that kind of stuff, and will approach every task um, in that way. All of these will create vastly different looking code. And because code bases tend to have multiple people on them, sometimes you can even tell who wrote which bit by understanding a people, person's individual preferences. Experience matters a lot as well. If you've seen a system like the one you're building before, that will have a huge impact on what you do this time. Um, I have built two or three user interface systems in the past. These days, thankfully, I don't have to because it's all already there off the shelf. Um, every time you do it, you will change what you do based on your experience of what you've seen before, but you'll also have commonalities based on what you've done before. Um, people who've worked a lot on servers and databases will have a particular transactional understanding of code structures and data transformation, which they will tend to apply to everything they do, um, because that's just what they're used to. Anyone who's worked on apps a lot will often make model view controller, which is a pattern that hopefully most of you are aware of, explicit. They will actually name things model, view, and controller, and they won't have classes which kind of sit between those spaces People who haven't worked in that way will often not do that, and even though they'll use those same concepts, they won't do it so explicitly. And there are also team norms around appropriate size of architecture. Is this a problem that's big enough to warrant designing a system around, or can I just build something that does the task immediately in front of me now? And finally, the situation is a massive influence on what code looks like. Um, optimization changes the way code looks. Usually this is not something that happens in the way code is originally written, but in the way code changes over time, um, because most people have learned that they shouldn't prematurely optimize. Sometimes you'll have a directive from your boss, and the boss will say, do it this way, and that's the way the code will look, because the boss said so. Um, sometimes you have a time constraint, just get it done. Huge influence on that first story I told was a just get it done remit that both we had when we inherited the code, and the original team had when they were producing it in the first place and resource constraints. Again, first example is a great example of this where they didn't have UI, user UI artists, so they built stuff in a way that worked for coders, not in a way that worked for art. So why does this matter? Well, part of being able to read code quickly is to be able to categorize it quickly, to be able to see it and build hypotheses about where it came from and why it looks the way it does, and to try and understand it in the context of those preferences. Is this something which has been built to fit a particular design pattern? Can that allow me to put it in a framework in my mind so that I can then work with it quickly and understand it in that way? It's also very, very easy to get frustrated with someone else's decisions, but they really did do that for a reason. No one goes out of their way to make your day bad, or at least I hope they don't. <laughs> Maybe they do. Um, but most of the time when people do something in a particular way, it's because of the experience they've had, their preferences, the situation in front of them. Um, I have seen it innumerable times. Um, I've even directed it at times when someone has come to me and or come to another lead and said, I really want to solve this problem right. I want to I sit down, I want to do engineering, I, 
I think there's a big solution to this problem in front of us. And the answer is, that's nice, but we have to have it finished next week. And it's like, well, what do you do? And, and then what usually happens is people say, let's write down how we should solve this problem later, and we'll come back to it. And you never do. Like, you just never, ever, ever do. So when you're dealing with frustrating code, trying to contextualize it can really help you to not feel frustration, which actually will help you work with it more efficiently, it will help you be a, uh, a more productive team member in that case. And if you understand the reasons behind a particular piece of code, you're far more likely to be able to make a good decision about fixing it, refactoring it, or throwing it away and starting again. And all of those are valid in different situations. I have seen cases where you end up with this absolutely horrendous system, which is a consequence of get it done. It needs to be done tomorrow. It's not well thought out. It was originally built by this person, then handed to this person, then handed to that person. And the solution really was, we just need to rip it out and, and rebuild it. But because you had that understanding of the context of it, the why and the how, it lets you think through that in a clear-headed way. And finally, these influences make the rules of a code base. And these rules, such that they are, once codified for yourself, you'll find it easier to find commonalities amongst the code, and thus you will be faster at working with it. So let's put this into a process. Step one. Obviously, lots of things are step one, but the very first and most important thing, if you can, is talk to people. I cannot emphasize this enough. Um, it has been the most frustrating thing to see situations emerge which could have been solved by a 20-minute conversation at the start of a particular task or scenario. Um, so your best resource when you're dealing with an unfamiliar code base is the team. And oftentimes, when you're dropping in, they'll be stressed out, but they're going to be a lot more stressed out if you do something that makes their lives even harder. So try to make yourself as productive as you can by actually talking to someone about where you are. Like, tell me about this code base. What should I know about it? Sometimes they won't tell you anything useful, but sometimes they'll tell you something that's really useful, like, ah, oh, um, destruction manager. That thing's everywhere. It's super annoying. Well, that's actually a hugely useful piece of information. When you find a destruction manager finagling its way into your code, you're like, this is actually a problem throughout the whole code base. Um, is there a way I can avoid it, or is this just something I have to deal with? Step two. As I said, you need to respect the remit. Whatever your remit is is very, very important when you're dropping into an unfamiliar code base, especially if you're in one of those high-stress end-of-project scenarios. So figure out what the task in front of you actually is. This might sound obvious, but if you receive a task that says something like, fix the list box on the inventory screen, and that's all it says, it's easy to make assumptions about that. And if someone who had been embedded on the team received that task, they probably would know what it meant. But you don't. So go and talk to whoever is responsible for the task. Maybe have a chat to the code lead about, like, oh, I want to approach it in this way. And then make a plan. So once you know what the task is, make a plan around the task. However, and again, another thing to factor into your process is don't go too broad. Code bases are very, very big. Game code bases are huge. They're sprawling, they're hundreds of files often. Um, you want to go to the limit that you need to understand to solve the specific problem in front of you so that you only build out the understanding of that particular subpart of the code base in one go. You, you cannot hold in your head a model of an entire game code base. Um, it's very rare that they actually simplify down in a way that anyone can. There might be some high-level systems which you can diagram out, and again, hopefully that first conversation you had when you came on the team will have exposed you to that kind of stuff, but you aren't going to get a deep understanding of everything in that way. And finally, review your understanding of the task with someone else, ideally someone in the know. So you can actually talk through your plan with someone give yourself a bit of uh, context to work with as you get started, which is what you should then do. Uh, once again, start small, very easy to get overwhelmed, work to the limits that you need to work to and no further when dealing with unfamiliar code. Um, it's just too easy to build out, understand, uh, build out unnecessary understanding that won't actually help you solve the problem in front of you. Um, I assume people know what rubber ducking is? Maybe not? 
Uh, so rubber ducking is a process where you get someone, um, just something I did a lot at Codemasters, did a lot at, back on uh, that project that I talked about in the first instance. I would grab my colleague Pierre, he's a real person, don't let him know I told you, um, and I would get him in a room and I'd say to him, hey Pierre, I'm trying to solve this problem with the UI, and he'd be like, okay. I'd be like, this thing is not where I need it to be, and it's because of these methods, and he'd be like, okay. I'd be like, I think I need to solve the problem in this way, and he'd say, okay. And then eventually I'd say, oh, I think I know what I need to do, and he'd say, okay, and that's the whole of the meeting. <laughs> rubber ducking is literally the process of talking to someone as if they were a rubber duck, <laughs> just to contextualize the task for yourself. Super useful, very valuable. I've also heard it referred to as an idiot lecture. So you're lecturing someone as if they were an idiot about something. Um, very useful. Uh, and then also use scaffolding for yourself. So I draw a lot of diagrams when dealing with unfamiliar code. Lots of boxes with arrows connecting them. This system connects to that system. This system depends on that one. Very helpful in terms of building out that baseline understanding that you need. Use version control very heavily if you find something confusing in code. So if you find a method that doesn't look like it should be there, or you find some stuff that's been commented out and is still there with a to-do with nothing next to it, then use version control to go back in time. Look over the timeline of the file. Extremely valuable as a way to understand why a file looks the way it does. And again, if possible, work on something you already have understanding of to give yourself that familiarity with the task to contrast with your unfamiliarity with the code base. I'm going to finish today with another story, and we can think about some of these things I've talked about in that context. So this situation is more recent. Uh, Shadow Wars was a game that Pickpock released about two years ago now. Um, great game. You should all go and download it. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, anyway, I was preparing to ship, and more hands were needed. Um, the code lead was on his way out, um, it was really no fault of his, um, he'd given us heaps of notice that he was going, um, but he was going, and that had a big consequence for the team, he needed to provide some stability to the team, and some crucial systems needed to be finished, in particular the asset delivery system was, had had fundamental project goals associated with it, and it hadn't been finished, so the idea there was that every single asset in the game maps, monsters, gem boards, should be able to be delivered remotely and changed at any time, um, even though we would include a base set in the core package. There are also lots of bugs, and there was a lot of refinement needed. So the job, such that it was, was help get the game into soft launch, um, finish the stuff necessary to maintain the game and ship it, and support the team as much as possible. So the reason the asset delivery system was taken on first, so this was this is me, I should say, um, that, that took this on. Um, I dropped into the team. Um, I guess I directed myself in this instance. Um, because that asset delivery system was one of the leads' jobs. And as people who have been leads will know, um, often you will allocate yourself a large task and then you will not do it because <laughs> you're really, really busy doing everything else. <laughs> So it was critical to shipping, it wasn't finished, it was orthogonal to the other tasks on the project, and no one who was already on the team had expert knowledge of it, um, apart from the lead who was leaving. So it made sense for me to take on that task. Uh, it was also the case that part of the remit was to make it work with on-demand resources. Um, I was very familiar with iOS, and I'd worked with on-demand resources on a tvOS game, so I had enough understanding to be dangerous, perhaps. Um, step one, talk to the outgoing lead. Uh, thankfully, we had a lot of time with him before he departed, as I said, and I wasn't going to fall into that trap I did last time of not making adequate use of a person. Um, I, I could see that it was very clear he wasn't going to get this task finished, so we needed to do a good handover and make a plan. So we went through his design, uh, we interrogated his decisions, um, and we worked to understand what was there and what was missing already. Step two make a plan, and then review that idea with the lead. So I sat down with the lead once I'd made my plan, and I said, here is what I'm going to do. Here are all the diagrams I've drawn. And he said to me, Jeremy, you completely understand this, and it cannot go wrong. Um, now, <laughs> we, we got there. <laughs> um, but we were also under a lot of time pressure at this point. We really did need to get the game into soft launch, and this had to be finished. So we ensured that the plan was iterative, so that we could prove out each step as it went. Um, so, for instance, in this case, um, 
there was already this idea that every asset in the game came from asset bundles. That was not a problem. But there was no abstraction layer to source the asset bundles from different places. There was no way to distribute a manifest file that we already had, which would tell you where the asset bundles were. So all of these pieces need to be put into place, and we could do them one at a time, commit them, and make them work. And then step three, build each step. Uh, I discussed what I was doing with the team a lot as I went. Um, Word to the wise, if you're ever working on something that affects a project's build system, you will break the build system. Um, and so it's important that when you're about to commit something that might break the build system, you find out whether people need to build before you do it. Um, so I did, so that was good. <laughs> um, and then try to ensure that at each stage everything still works. Um, and build out understanding of dependent systems one at a time. So for instance, when I was working on the manifest system, I was only working on the manifest system and only going far enough to understand the systems around that. Shadow Wars remains among the most complicated code bases I have ever worked on. Um, and it, it is vast, and the actual way the asset delivery system works in and of itself is a, a, an hour-long talk. I'm not going to get into it today because it's just way too complicated. Um, so, yeah, that's what I did. After that task, I was embedded on the project. Um, which was good because we still needed additional hands. It's like if someone drops in for coffee and they stay for three weeks, well, they really should be paying rent. So after I'd done this rather large and involved task, I, I was well embedded. I did a bunch of other things after this. I did load and memory optimization, uh, general bug fixing, supported the development of raids. Um, and that first task, although massive and with elements well outside my comfort zone, acted as a lever to get me into the code base to help me build the understanding I needed in order to be productive and effective within it. Understanding the goals and intent of the code I needed to modify allowed me to do it relatively efficiently and without too many bugs. Although I will say that Apple broke on-demand resources in iOS 10 and that ruined half my good work. That's fine. <laughs> so to finish up, in review, being productive in an unfamiliar code base is at its core about understanding that code base. And I would stress, in my opinion at least, that understanding any code base is about understanding the decisions that went into that code base. When they happened, why they happened, contextualize them with a human lens on the thinking that you apply. You also can't do this all in one step. It's simply too big and may not even be relevant to what you're trying to do. Talk to people. Talk to people. Sorry. Talk to people when you start. Get from them what you can. Start small so you're not overwhelmed. When you look at code, try to understand the thought process that went into it. Go one step at a time. Talk to people again. And as you learn, codify the rules of that code base for yourself. And then you can apply them as you continue to work with the code base. And I hope, with all that in mind, that when you are confronted with this sort of scenario, you feel a little bit less like the blue guy in the hat, or the guy in the blue hat. And that's it.